Hi, everyone. Welcome to Heart of the Matter. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas, and almost Happy New Year. We are almost to 2021. And in honor of almost New Year's, we have a great conversation today with Andrew Zimmern. You probably know him. He's a television personality, a very famous chef. He's a writer, a teacher, a social justice advocate. He's got a great show on the travel channel called Bizarre Foods. Um, there's actually, if you look him up on the website, there's something called Gross Foods Andrew Zimmern Actually Ate on Bizarre Foods. My kids love that. Um, they can't believe what he eats. But what you might not know about Andrew is that he has been in recovery for 28 years. Andrew um, was actually a drug and alcohol, um, addicted to drugs and alcohol. He was, as he <laughs> will tell you in just a few minutes, he was uh, really fell far down, had a real struggle getting sober. He was homeless for a year until friends found him and got him help. He actually says he lost 15 years of his life to this disease of addiction. I love talking to Andrew. He is one of the most interesting people that I've had the chance to get to know while doing this podcast. And I think you're gonna enjoy this as much as I did. It's so great to talk to you and congratulations on how many days of sobriety now? 10,515 10, as of this morning when I woke up. That's amazing. Yeah. Really it's, inspiring. It's a, it's a, sometimes you, you get sort of a, a distance telescope reversal syndrome or whatever we choose to, to dub it, where you see something up close and personal of your own that you've not been able to see before. Um, and I, I really, there was a point in my sobriety early on where I was like, you know, I've got three years and, you know, you just kind of strut around the room like you know everything. Um, just an <laughs> awful uh, uh, character defect of mine um, that I share with a lot of other recovering people. Um, and then you go through a phase, you know, and you kind of hit like 20 years and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm, that, that's a big number. Like you never imagined that. I'm a, my next anniversary, um, I will have been sober for uh, half the time I've been alive. Wow. Um, so I'll, when I, when I, a year from now, when I turn 60, I'll be in my 30, that same year, I'll have a 30, my 30th year anniversary. And that's crazy. Um, but I have this little, uh, you know, I always used to tell, or I still do tell guys that uh, I mentor in a 12 step program. And my mentor in one of my 12 step programs told me a long time ago uh, to put uh, some of my literature underneath my bed because it would help me get on my knees in the morning. <laughs> Something that is a Jew from New York was completely antithetical from everything that I had learned uh, growing up. And, uh, but now for myself, I try to make it really handy. So I have like, like my texts and my daily routine, even though after 10,515 days, I've practically memorized it. When I get to a passage in my one day at a time book or some of those other things or the, the, the little spiritual practices that I do, I've, I've got them memorized. But on the one thing, I've got this new book and it has a day counter in it. So every morning I sort of, I, and I kind of ignore it. I don't pay attention. But two weeks ago when I had 10,500 days, I was just like, oh my gosh, that is a, that's just a huge number. It, that's a lot of one day at a time. So Did you ever dream that you would acquire 29 years of sobriety? No, I wanted to die. Went? Yeah, I, I wanted to die. I didn't. I didn't want to be of this place and be with you people. Um, I was ashamed. I was a loser. I was uh, unaware of the trauma I had endured, and you know, trauma not transformed is transmitted. And so I was shoving my trauma off. I mean, I was shedding trauma virus. You know. <laughs> going to make a bad COVID-19 joke there. But I was, I mean, really, I was just, I was toxic in every sense of the, the word. People couldn't be around me. My parents thought I was dead, had given up on me. My friends didn't want to be around me or help me. They'd been burned too many times. It was, it was exhausting and abusive 
to 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 know me or talk to me. You started uh, drinking and using drugs when you were 14 years old. Yep. And you used technically 13 and change, but yes, 13 and change. And you didn't get sober until you were 30. Correct. You once said, "I lost 15 years of my life to this disease." Yes. And yet you also say during a large part of that time, you were so highly functional that you deluded yourself into thinking this was manageable. Even, yes. even what so many people I know in recovery, I myself in recovery, I normalized things that I now look back and think, oh my God, how could I possibly think that this was an okay way to live? Um, as, as a fellow traveler, you understand that several things can be true at the same time, even though to other people it would appear that they are mutually exclusive. Um, I did lose those years. I don't remember the 80s. It's a lost decade to me. I mean, truly there are parts of those years that I just don't have a lot of recollection of. Um, I was almost in perpetual blackout for a very large portion of them, of those years. Yet at the same time, I had the talent and the ability to go in and work in an industry that is uh, patriarchal, sexist, abusive, and uh, the restaurant industry during the <laughs> 80s is what I'm describing, um, and also all my relationships. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I mean, okay. I was no good at them then. I mean, uh, but the... The, the fact of the matter was is that I could put out 200 egg orders at brunch. I could handle uh, 150 orders of risotto in an 80 seat Italian restaurant, uh, two star Michelin. You know, the, so when you have that skill set, chefs, owners, etc. And and by the way, then when I became a chef and a restaurant owner, I had to remind myself, you can't overlook it. You can't overlook it. You can't overlook it. But when I was the worker, I, I knew that I had a skill set that was at such a high level, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, it's just the, the reality yourself. You're the reality of it is, is that they, I knew they wouldn't fire me. They couldn't, literally couldn't do it without me. Um, and eventually, when I started to partner in restaurants with uh, other people in New York and started to rise up in the game, I created deals for myself that kind of insulated me from a contractual standpoint from a lot of my problems. And I became the one who was in charge of uh, balancing out all the registers and things. I volu no, one, no one wanted, none of the partners in some of the restaurants that I was involved in at the, towards the end of my career before I became unemployable unpartnerable, uh, non-functional. Um, I volunteered to do the stuff late at night that no one else wanted to do because I knew with the old NCR 2160 cash machines and my manager's code and my little key that I could, I could play games with the register and be pocketing a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars cash from each one, uh, and make you a tidy little sum to support my drug habit. Mm. So you made yourself indispensable and your raw natural talent made you unfireable because they needed you. Well, yeah, which by the way is, is fairly common when you talk to a lot of people in our, uh, who are long time sober and you really get a chance to dig into the nuts and bolts of some of this. The, the contrast is, it's almost Shakespearean in a way. And I, I really don't mean to over-dramatize these sort of really tawdry elements of my life. At, at, its, at its very core, I was a user of people and a taker of things. I was not a good person. You did not want to be around me. Like I said, I was toxic. But at the same time, the Shakespearean aspect of the storytelling is just, un, it's unbelievable. I work, you know, eight, nine days in a row, fleece the cash register, go to an after-hours club, and 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 literally my lips to God's ears wake up three days later in the Bahamas. Um, and then I have to call work and say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get a plane uh, and <laughs> off I would, you know, and then I'd return. And one of, in the addiction episode of what's eating America, um, my old uh, boss and then partner, Steve Hansen, who owned the BR guest company before he sold it uh, the business that we sort of started together uh, said to me, or said to our camera in a producer interview, I, 
I thought about fire, I'm paraphrasing here, I thought about firing him all the time, but how was I going to replace him? You know, and that's the quandary you put people in. As an addict and alcoholic, you learn to push those levers. Your survival skills are so honed, which is why I, I love to describe myself as a user of people and a taker of things. I was struck by you not so long ago posted a picture of yourself uh, on Instagram and said, quote, throwback Thursday, 1982 or so, deranged, drunk and drugged. I was a dangerous mess and still took almost a decade to sober up. The smile on the outside is a mask. The pain on the inside was unimaginable. I can relate to that. I think a lot of people um, who suffer from the disease of addiction can relate to that. It looks so great, so bright and shiny on the outside. And what's going on on the inside is so terrible. Yeah. Um... Sorry, it's uh, it's really hard. Uh, I'm glad I wrote that, but it's also I've, I've had that thrown back at me more than once uh, since I posted it. Um, and it's impossible to uh, be reminded of those words and not think of all the people that just you know shoot up an extra bag, knowing they're never going to wake up. Uh, the people who, who just the pain of whatever their ism is was so unbearable uh, that they uh, make the decision to exit our living world. Um, and over the years, staying here in Minnesota, where I sobered up, uh, it's still a weekly reminder from somebody, hey, you remember, you remember, Tom T from Thursday nights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He, you know, relapsed and killed himself or got drunk and drove down an up ramp on the highway. Um, or some very public faces who were close friends of mine that we've lost over the last couple of years. Um, it's just, it's brutal because you, uh, uh, you said you could relate to them as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that everyone uh, as you intimated, who has been there can relate to it. And I think the secret to sobriety, if, if it didn't get me uh, choked up, uh, I would, uh, I'd want someone to, to take me to a meeting or check me back into, into rehab or to get something there. Because if you don't keep it green for your, if you don't keep it green for yourself, if you, um, if you don't keep that, those thoughts and feelings fresh enough, uh, I, I think the longer you stay sober, the less of a chance you have of staying sober and being an effective member of society. I think keeping it green is a way of maintaining our humility. It's a way of maintaining our sense of urgency around our spiritual condition. I think it is a constant source of the desire and need for spiritual growth. You mentioned a moment ago that, you know, you were struck after we talked about that post of yours by how many people, um, you know, don't, don't get it, who do suffer the worst consequences. And I can't help but think about your good friend, Anthony Bourdain, uh -huh. who um, I, I profiled and interviewed several times <clears throat> and you know, look again, like a person from the outside looking in sure. who had it all and was clearly struggling. And it's just another example of you, you never know, you know, comparing, looking at somebody's outsides, what might be going on inside. With something as, as severe as the amount of pain that, that for those people were the only way out is to permanently erase the chance of any of that pain happening. That is it, I believe, at such a extreme level. And I'm not a doctor. Mm. Plenty of books have been written about this. I, I read a book, uh, a couple of clinical books on suicide after I lost uh, one of my good friends, uh, actually one of the guys who got me sober, um, overdosed 20 something years ago, uh, 18 years ago. Um, and, uh, 
I needed to understand what was going on because I knew, as did all his other friends, he was too much of a good drug addict. He didn't just buy some good stuff and put it in. So he knew what was what he was doing. Um, and, you know, so I've, I've, I've read a lot about this. The, the pain has to be so unmanageable that I also believe those people in some cases are really good at masking it. Robin Williams felt a desperate need to tell everyone that he was so depressed all the time that he often thought of taking his own life. He, he said it in interviews and stuff. Um, and, you know, then there, you know, we lose people like, you know, uh, Heath Ledger and afterwards everyone is like, oh yeah, he was doing a lot of drugs. We were all worried about him. Philip right? Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman, same thing. The people around him all say we knew. With all the people around uh, Tony, there was a, a much different feeling. Um, he was exquisitely talented at masking those things. I think the people closest to him knew that there were one or two areas of his life that just were, were causing him too much angst. Hmm. And did I think that at the, that that would be something that would create that sort of vibe for him? Absolutely not. Otherwise I would have thrown myself in front of that train. I mean, um, it, uh, it sort of defies description. It is a piece of our humanity that is as often as doctors and people try to explain it is inexplicable. You were working, you had a lot of success professionally in your twenties did you lose it all? I mean, I know that year when you yes. talk about sleeping on a pile of dirty clothes with yes. in a ring of comet, which I, you know, I did not know. Apparently, keeps away, as you put it, roaches and rats. Um, you didn't. You weren't working in a restaurant at that point. No, I was fully unfunctional, right? Uh, and beyond human aid, and just waiting to die. Uh, I was struck by something you actually had written once, where or that you had said that. I couldn't even count how many times somebody threw a life preserver to me and I threw it back up on the boat. Like you were because, just- Because I didn't like the color orange. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you that, didn't want help. Yeah. But it's, it, it is, you enter that place that we talked about at the beginning of you know, the, I don't care, mm. you know, you get a, you get a case of the fuckets and that, I mean, that includes your own life. You don't care. Um, so what changed? I, I, what I, happened? Uh, uh, a miracle. Um, I, I, I had stolen a bunch of stuff, hocked it, uh, found myself a flop host hotel, got two cases of pop off uh, vodka that had just come out in plastic bottles, which I will never forget because one day I was buying the booze and it was in glass bottles. And then the next day when I went to drink myself to death, I, I went and got two cases and I kind of crouched down low to, to, use my legs. I mean, the irony of this, I'm going to drink myself to death. And I remember this moment and I remember like, Oh, don't hurt your back. You know, like, <laughs> so lift with your legs. Um, and I went to grab the, the cases and they were super light. And I was like, Oh my God. And I looked at the guy, like, are you cheating me? Is there only half the bottles in there? And he looks at me, he goes, brand new plastic bottles. And I'm like, cool. I go upstairs to the hotel room. I've yanked the phone cord out of the wall. Uh, the, uh, I mean, there were no services in this type of hotel. You know, it's 10 bucks a night. And uh, I had locked my door and I just drank around the clock. I was there, I know for sure I was there four days. I know I wasn't there more than six. So d day four or five, I wake up, well, come to. And because uh, I certainly wasn't sleeping, I was only passing out. And literally for the first time in my life, that ace bandage that just, got wrapped so tight around my chest when I was a kid. Mm. For the first time in my life, literally the first time in my life was not there. It was the first time in, uh, since I was 15, first time in 15 years that I didn't reach for a joint, a drink, a line, a bump, or a pill. What was gone? I Anxiety? Was, I depression? What? Yeah, that ace bandage of worry, that cloud that followed me wherever I went, that I wasn't good enough, that I couldn't handle the situation, that I couldn't be me, all of that negative message uh, 
making that I had fed myself for years, fostered by the trauma of my childhood, uh, it wasn't there. It was not there. And I was, to this day, I, I, I now call it a, a, a spiritual experience because I know that's what it was. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm happy to defend that with, you know, all comers. It, it was, I remember being eight and having that feeling before going to school. Um, and I know it predated that. Um, and I had always felt that way. And mm. I believe it dated back to my parents' divorce when I was five. And uh, it sort of never stopped. And because those issues were never addressed in my family, my dad was a decorated Navy vet. Uh, we're recording this on Veterans Day, so I always think of him. Uh, my served, dad's a vet too. I'm a Served in the Pacific. Served yeah. in the Pacific for three years in World War II. Um, and he was that generation where it's like, you know, tragedy happens. We don't talk, well, we'll talk about it this once. We'll acknowledge it together, maybe one more time. And then we're never going to speak about it. We're going to stuff that son of a bitch so far down and put our chin up and our shoulders back. And we are going to storm that beach. That's the way my dad approached all of life. He was my hero. Um, but I also didn't realize how defective that was, how traumatic that was to a 13 year old. Um, yeah. Or that his desire to run his life his way because he was a his life, his way guy, uh, maybe wasn't in my best interest uh, when tragedy struck my mother and he let me live for several years uh, as the ultimate latchkey kid uh, in my mother's old apartment. Um, supervised by strangers, but not by my parent. Um, and so, you know, I was, I had that tension. I had that, those things in my life before I picked up the drink or the drug, the drink or the drug was my solution to not feeling those things anymore. Uh, eventually it stopped working for me. Uh, tragic things happened for 10, 12, 14 years. I kept going down, 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 eventually wanted to kill myself. So the fact that I woke up one morning and actually, not only didn't feel that ace bandage of tension in my chest, not only it was the first morning ever, other than waking up in a jail or institution, by the way, able to get high later on, because you can get high inside anywhere, um, mm. but you can't just reach for it. It's not necessarily like right there. Um, other than that, I would always reach for it, always. It was right by my bed. It was my wubby. It was my blankie. <laughs> Um, and instead of reaching for it, because there were bottles there, I plugged the phone in and called my friend and told him where I was and asked him if he would come get me. Now, what's unusual about that is that I, I think it was like the, the last time I had asked someone for help, uh, and by the way, I was 29 years old when I called my friend Clark. I think it was eighth or ninth grade was the last time I asked anybody for help, like with yeah. my homework or something. I mean, I think that was, I mean, I literally was the biggest no, no at all. I was so, I wish you could have seen what a crappy human being I was when I was young and using. I'm just, just unredeemable, um, ridiculous version of the person I am now. Um, and so the fact that I did this, this, to me, crazy thing to connect to another human being and ask for help uh, was the other half of that miracle that happened that day. It set a string of events and motions that three days later I wound up uh, on the medical unit, Ignatia, at what is now Hazel and Betty Ford, and began my uh, journey in recovery, and that was January 28th, 1992. <laughs> You said in one interview that the most caring and compassionate thing that you can do for another human being is sprinkle them with dignity and respect and show them that you love them. That's what human beings need to get well. At a time when so many people right now, you know, often shame people with um, addiction issues, um, punish them, judge them, denigrate them. In that one moment in your life, somebody showed you love and dignity and respect and it's so counterintuitive and yet so so absolutely true that the one thing that helps people get sober and clean the most is treating them with love and respect and not shame yes 
um, I, I, I will say the, the, the first and most important example of it, I, I can look back at my story and see where other people uh, did it. And I know that several of the people at what was my last intervention, wasn't mm -hmm. my first, but it was the last. Uh, I know that some of those people um, were in a program. I know some of them were in 12-step programs. I know that they were aware of the service component to the recovery model. Um, but I remember getting out of treatment and the night that I was sleeping on someone's couch and about to get into the halfway house the next day, I had that one free night. My, my friends from New York who went to Dalton with me who also were living in uh, the Twin Cities, uh, I think we calculated once that like 10% of the three classes, that my class and the one above and below it, 10% mm -hmm. of the students uh, had all gone through Hazelden within a couple of years of each other. I mean, it's kind of a staggering uh, wow. testament to what 1970s high school drug use was like. Um, the, the, the friends of mine took me to a meeting. It was my first meeting in the Twin Cities. And because I'd been up in Center City of Treatment, and then I was about to check into the halfway house, and it, was, it had snowed. It was February, uh, and um, late February or early March. must have been actually early March because I was in treatment for five weeks. So it's the first week in March. There's snow on the ground. And I go to this meeting, and it's, it's in a house on this avenue, and there's like a 50-foot walkway to the steps going up to the house. And their snow plows had plowed this path all winter long. So it was like five feet of snow on either side. And there's this lady in the middle of the path. And she just looked stunning. She was in her late 50s. She had a tweed skirt suit on, stockings and sensible shoes and a, a little sort of fox throw around her so shoulders and a matching hat. And she just, she smelled good and she looked good. And she just was, she just screamed stability and love. And she just, so being six weeks from being homeless, I like tried to walk through the snow around her to get back on the path because I didn't know why she was standing there. And I was too embarrassed to ask her um, what she was doing there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it occurred to me as I'm kind of walking around her, oh my God, she's the greeter. I wasn't totally unaware of how meetings worked. And... I was like, oh shit, she's the greeter. And she put an arm out and kind of pulled me over. I hadn't said anything. And just gave me a hug and said, nice to have you here. And then went to the next person. And I kept walking and I just burst into tears. Wow. I, no one had said, no one had greeted me and told me that they wanted me there for, I mean, I couldn't remember the last time. A long time. I didn't want to be around myself. And so to have someone say that, was the thing that kind of got me into this. It was the, the component to what you were talking about that convinced me that this service model, this care for other people, this idea of dignity and respect sprinkled on a human being, that was the first time that I became aware of it in real time. Mm-hmm. And uh, many years later, well, not many, six years later, I went to my mentor in my 12-step group, and I told him that my insides weren't matching my outsides anymore. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, I go to work. It's all about the money. It's all about the job. I'm in a windowless room with 14 other people. I'm screaming and yelling at them. I'm not treating them like the newcomer at the meeting. I'm treating them like a commodity. I don't like the person I am at work. I like the person I am when I'm not at work. And my, my sponsor had been working with me for a long time on trying to treat people at work like I do the newcomer at a meeting. And uh, it just wasn't working for me. And I said, I, I realized what's not working is I need to leave restaurant. And I've done nothing but work in restaurants since I was 14. And um, it was all around being in a place where I could learn it wasn't about those people. I just didn't have the skill set to treat other people with dignity and respect. I returned to the restaurant business and to other businesses once I learned how. But when I left restaurants and I started getting into media and stuff like that and I slowed my life down and I was able to be, you know, as a chef in a restaurant, I was the one who knew the most in the building. When I took the internship at the TV station, 
uh, to try to get on air and get some practice. I didn't know how to edit tape. I didn't know yeah. what tape was. I didn't mm. know how to do any of it. I was the beginner. And it turned out, I didn't intend it that way, but it turned out that, that the best beneficial part of writing my own syllabus for life and training and moving forward in the things that I wanted to do was that I got to be a newcomer at something again. You uh, were lucky enough to go to Betty Ford Hazelton um, mm -hmm. and to live in a halfway house where you got a job washing dishes in a yep. restaurant and once again, starting from scratch, from zero, built your empire right back up. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked a lot about the importance of treatment being affordable and available um, to everybody because mm -hmm. it isn't in this country, even with the Affordable Care Act um, insurance companies well, consistently and almost chronically refuse to pay. And it's worse because we actually take people whose primary issue is addiction and alcoholism and we throw them in jails for petty crimes. And so they're not going to get their problems solved there. If they were a, a real criminal, uh, the issue, of course, would be they needed whatever reformative measures were taken within walls. That's a whole different issue because we're actually, we don't do anything within those walls to help those people. Um, it is, it is vital that we have diversion programs to, to help our criminal justice reform. We would take 25, 30% of the people out of that system and get them the help they actually needed. That would lighten up the load on anyone working in criminal justice, right? Mm -hmm. If they didn't have as much stuff to prosecute, people to bust, put into prisons, taking up cots, all the rest of that. Um, and then, of course, for those that need it and need to be separated from their chemicals, some people could just get dry and then move on to whatever treatment modality they want. Other people need to be systematically uh, put into a place where they can get the therapy they desperately need and get sprinkled with that dignity and love and respect that we're talking about. And that is, that is a very crucial thing. I think it, when I went to Hazelden, it was 30 grand, 28 grand, something like that. Insurance paid for half of it. My friends paid for the other half. Um, I ended up paying that back um, the first year I was sober by working. Um, there is, uh, public treatment that's available in many states, some better than others. Um, I've, been, I've seen really good programs, uh, public programs in Minnesota, in North Dakota, um, and a bunch of other states. It's just very hard to access, in a, and in a lot of states, that system is overwhelmed. So, yeah, we have a, we have a big problem in this country, and I, it, it's part of the mental health parity laws that the late Congressman Jim Ramstad, who just passed away last week, and Paul Wellstone, they, they're the ones that politicized me. Uh, you know, they, they knew someone who was civically engaged and could be persuaded to door knock and talk to people about the importance of mental health parity laws. But, you know, if you get a broken bone, you go to the hospital, they set it, no doctor says, well, you, I don't know how you're going to pay for it, so you can't get treatment for your leg. So why is it that people who can't afford treatment can't get money if their problem is or alcoholism. Even with something more analogous, you know, look at diabetes, another yes. chronic disease. Yes. We don't, you know, doctors it costs don't us say, a trillion dollars a year. Exactly. By the way. And 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 yet insurance companies don't say, ah, uh, no, I don't know. We, we we're only paying for two weeks of treatment, not four weeks. And we think that an outpatient program might be just as good as an inpatient pro I mean it is it's insane how yeah, much, criminal. how many people, when they do finally get that moment that you had when you woke up that morning without the ace bandage of anxiety, um, you know, gripping you, and you reached out for help and got it. There are many people who get to that point and reach out for help and still can't get it. And there are many, there are many people, by the way, who do get into treatment and halfway house because I knew them. They carried the message to me. Uh, who went out and got drunk and died. So just because you get into treatment isn't, a, it, you know, I mean, it, it, that's, that's the best we got for sure. It's still not perfect, but it is the best we got. And I mention that because so many people use those numbers against us instead of for us. Nobody would say that we shouldn't treat somebody uh, with cancer just because the odds are they're not going to make it. 
So let what do we do? Just put them in like the the uh, leprosy colony where you or just if your cancer comes back. Oh yeah, let them. Back? I mean, oh, well, I mean, now we're not. Now we're done. We're not going to treat it, you. It's it's ridiculous. But why do you think? And sticking just with the issue of addiction, why do you think that we as a society are so willing to not treat, to not help? to selfishness stick but it costs us yes it costs us hundreds of billions of dollars a year and actually actually trillions uh, we've done the math i've i've had a team of researchers on this for uh episodes of what's in america that we didn't get to make and hopefully we'll be be making soon but we do it because we don't always act in our best interest and we have a selfishness that's been bred into our convenience me first society uh that is very very dangerous um, the, uh, I, I don't want to turn the clock back to the days of the horse and buggy. People were worse off back then. I mean, we romanticize the good old days. The good old days were not so great. We've made progress as a society and moved forward in, in leaps and bounds. Um, we've even done, despite all of our mistakes, have, have elevated the poverty line, right, in globally, right? So we know that to a certain degree, things are getting better. The, the problem that you're talking about is that we're not, it's like dribbling all the way down the court and then blowing the layup. It's the easy part now, to your point. We know the solution. We know what it costs. We know that if we spend that money, we'll save, save way more, way more. So why won't we do it? And the issue is selfishness and a, an amount of risk-taking that we do not see uh, on the political landscape. It's, it's why different groups that I'm involved in now, uh, I really only care to be involved with them if they're actually, the goal is to change policy and law because without policy and law, it's what attracted me to the mental health parity law uh, issues in the 90s. Mm. If we don't actually give the laws teeth, it's why, I mean, I like to think of myself as civically engaged. People who don't like what I say call me a, a, another one of those celebrities that talks politics. Uh, I, I don't like that label. I still think of myself as civically engaged. Uh, but it is a, to me, it is an obvious solution. And the obvious reason that we don't is selfishness and self-centeredness. You can trace it back to that every single time. <clears throat> Do you think part of the problem might also be what you referred to in your own story is that period of time when you, when people did throw you life preservers and you were throwing them back on the boat. Yes. Um, I mean, there is a component of, uh, it's what leads to all the stigmatizing of addicts, I think. Um, what leads to a lot of the shaming of the addict or the alcoholic, I think, because there are times in our lives, I include myself in that as an, as an alcoholic, as you know, when when our behavior, when we push people away, and and therefore, and so then, well, we we're criminals. We deserve to be shunned at that point. I'm stealing purses. That's not right. But I will say that I think a lot of it comes from other people's unresolved trauma. We do a really crap. Every time somebody uses the word shame, I hear the word trauma, because I know from uh, a lot of work in this area and a lot of things that uh, just. A lot of stuff I'm involved in. You know, trauma not transformed is transmitted, right? So we have years, generational trauma that's been handed down to people that causes them to act in a certain way. It's why when I say we need to treat everyone with patience, love, and understanding, I do mean everyone, even the person who is on the exact opposite side of the issues with me. We have to figure out a way to connect with those people because they have been suffering from generational trauma too. So therefore, they reach out and stigmatize and practice selfishness and practice their own ism, whatever that may be. You know, I, I, I mean, look, I'm not popular in my industry. I don't get a lot of uh, commercial endorsements because I'm very vocal. That stuff goes to the people that are neutral and sit on the sidelines and don't pick a side. I want to fucking pick a side. I'm on the side of picking sides. And then I want to fight like hell for there to be no sides. Andrew Zimmern, thank you so much for talking about your fight um, and your passion about the disease of addiction and, as so, and so many other things in our country. It's been wonderful talking to you today. Likewise. 
Thank you so much for listening to our talk today with Andrew Zimmern. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And as a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who's struggling with substance use, you can text 55753 or visit drugfree.org. We'll talk to you soon.